What's up, Grinder School? This is Carithers. I'm here today with my student, Jake. You want to say hello, man? Hey, guys. How's it going? Um, Jake's my volunteer, my participant in this new series where we're going to focus in on the learner and sort of tailor our coaching towards his needs and things like that. So Jake's playing four tables at 25 in the limit for us today um, on full tilt. And we're going to go through and talk about what he wants to work on during this series and what we can do to improve his game. Do you want to give everyone like a quick rundown on where you're at with poker, your background, etc.? Yeah, I used to play throughout university, um, play to live, if that makes sense, um, throughout university. And I ended up playing a little bit full time after university at 50 and 100, no, no, four ring. Um, then I sort of decided that poker really wasn't for me long term, so got a job. Um, and now I'm back with more free time, so I've sort of tried to get back into poker and make some money, move to six max to try and improve my game. Um, decided to get a coach because I thought it would speed up the process of getting back into it and help me, gives me some motivation to actually play and put in some hands rather than trying to bundle around the forums and stuff on my own. So it's been good. Happy working with characters. Um, my aim really is to get to 100 and now make sort of a decent side income yeah um, and then go from there really mix in good one two games and stuff but I think that's quite a far way off yeah so cool cool yeah well um, baby steps in poker as always it's a slow long term process as, as I'm sure you know how do you think the games have changed since you've been away and now back again have you noticed anything like really striking um I think there's obviously more regulars and stuff, but the games are obviously a bit tougher. But as I used to play, I used to play four ring mainly, so six max games are. I did. I've played about a hundred thousand hands of fifty six max and a hundred six max, but I was only a break even player, so I want to try and get. It's more more of the challenge rather than the monetary value, really. Just to try and you know say that I can succeed at poker yeah. rather than. Being a break-even player, I want to try and win a little bit of money at the tables, obviously. All right, nice one. Um, so, since you've been back, have you noticed any areas of your game that are particularly, you know, still good from before, or any that are rusty and need a lot of improvement? And um, where would you uh, diagnose your, your main sort of issues right now? Um, I'd say probably the, one of the most obvious things would be through that pots. Facing three bets, obviously, because my background is four ring. You're facing three bets on a much higher frequency at six max, and the ranges are wider and stuff like that, which yeah. is also another thing I need to work on. Yeah. Uh, post flop, which is you know wider banning ranges, c betting ranges, um, three betting and stuff, and also blind play because you obviously need to. Although it shouldn't vary that much from six max to four ring. I feel that my blind play when I out position, late position needs to be improved. I did have that was one of the leaks when I used to play a lot was my blind win rates weren't good and I used to play quite passively post flop out the blinds, things like that. Uh -huh. um, but I'd say the main thing is through betting and uh, post flop ranges, okay. uh, um, narrowing ranges to uh, villains rather than. You know, it's just dealing with wider ranges. It takes a bit of getting used to. Yeah, so sort of making a step up from from full ring. Also, yeah, there's a big difference. Of course, it's like twofold here because you're playing full ring a few years ago when the games aren't so aggressive, and then you're jumping. You're kind of double jumping, if you know what I mean, because you're going yeah. straight into six max in 2013, which is definitely a lot more aggressive. So, cool. So we're going to look at play from the blinds. We're going to look at three betting, being the three better, or sort of reacting to the to the three bet four um, bet sort of dynamic. Oh, really? Uh, uh, I want to kind of develop, I don't want to just play like sort of like 19, 16, 18, 16. Yeah. I want to be sort of playing like 24, 20 with a 7, 8% free bet. Yeah. So I want to be one of the more annoying regs rather than sort of, Yeah. so I can get into just some fun spots and yeah. mess with regs and stuff like that rather than just, and yeah. I just make it a bit more fun rather than For sure. finding out, you want to provoke mistakes. Sort of mm -hmm. You want to provoke mistakes from your opponents as well and if you're one of the more semi-lag 24-20 regs, I know for for one that it's definitely far more tilting to play against those guys than it is to play against the 19-16 5% 3-bet guys. So yeah, 
Um, seems like you've got some good realistic um, goals for the near future, and we can certainly look at blind play. We'll be looking at um, three betting with some good ranges, and also reacting to three betting, and then sort of putting our opponents in a range post flop um, and going from there. Okay, is there any kind of spot that comes up that you feel like particularly uncomfortable in? It's mainly just from the blinds and the three betting kind of wars here. Um. It doesn't happen very often, but I mean, when you're in sort of middle position and facing button three bets and cut yeah. three bets, it doesn't happen very often at 25 an hour, but I imagine it does happen often at a higher stakes. Yeah, for so sure. being comfortable with those mm -hmm. would be would be handy. And also, obviously, then you've got, to, you've got when you're button facing blind three bets, you know, you can want to play, play pots in position and stuff like that. Post flop, those are sort of you know, sure. I'm not 100% comfortable, but I am getting more comfortable, but I would like to be more comfortable. Yeah, because we sense. did a bit of work on that recently, didn't we? Like just sort of coming up with some good default ranges for how we're going to play the very common situations pre-flop against regulars, like facing three bets and also three betting ourselves. And um, Maybe you want to tell them, tell the ground school a little bit about what we've been doing and how, how do we go about sort of ingraining good solid ranges for default situations? Yeah, so we... We looked at combos, didn't we, of um, our range, different weighted ranges, um, which I found has really helped me as a starting point. Uh, we've decided that regs at these stakes, they have their fullback range is way, weighted towards um, value, so we could we could counteract that by having a really bluff heavy three bet range so mm -hmm. we sort of have a two to one combo range on our three bet bluffs yeah. in late position um, I was uh, with the original range I did um, was I was flying too much out of position uh, and not calling enough in position so I wasn't maybe using position enough mm -hmm. which I mean that with stuff like connected um, middle connected ball rays like king 10 queen 10 jack 10 yeah King nine stuff like that. I was trying to flatten them out of position, which obviously inevitably may not be a that big of a mistake pre flop, but when you're facing barrels and it just makes it harder to play. Yeah, and for sure. I mean a lack of information. Competent regs, yeah. Yeah. Can cost you in those kind of spots playing marginal hands if you're not exactly sure what your opponent's sort of tendencies and things are. Um post flop. Okay. Cool. So that gives us basically an idea of some stuff that we can be working on. And it means that in the meantime as well, um, what I can do is hopefully find some areas in this session today where you do things that maybe I'm not fully happy with and we can talk about why and we can sort of add to that and build up an arsenal of things that we want to work on. Um, and we want to balance, obviously, learning new stuff, which we've been doing. We've been talking about like learning how to construct ranges and how to weight combos and all of that. So if we think about the inchworm approach where you've got the the end of your worm which is like progressing forward and learning new stuff all the time and exploring new lands we've been doing that with all our pre-flop stuff and now what we're looking to do is also make sure we're plugging all the holes that are in the game as well and making sure that we move your game along at the right pace and make sure that the back end of your game is advancing with the new stuff you're learning at the front so that's kind of the idea um so yeah what we'll do is we'll play hands and I want you now just to talk a little bit about everything you're doing and sort of explain why you're doing it and then I'll sort of give my input and any questions you can go ahead and ask and we'll just get right into the, yeah. the poker. Uh, the Jack Queen off was close. I was going to fly, but fly down position down bottom left table, table three. Sorry, but can I'm you just bring up the it. hand history so they can see? Yeah, sure. It was just this hand, the, mm -hmm. a reg open from effectively the car. Yeah. But I was... I was tempted to flat, but he is fairly aggressive on the loose aggressive side. Um, so I just opted for it. I think four handed I could potentially flat, but Yeah, um, I would definitely yeah. say it's too loose to go ahead and flat there. Um sorry, can we do anything about that background noise? It's just a little bit it's a little bit loud yeah. in the background, sorry. Yeah, one one second, let me just Cheers. shut So yeah, I think the the Queen Jack hand, um, you've got a guy who's 28, 27, he's opening the cutoff, but you're out of position, you have a hand, although it's not doing like horrendously against his range, when you 
you pair the fact that you don't have that much equity against this range. It's not like you're doing well um, with the fact you're out of position, have no initiative, and don't really have any relevant reads as of yet as to how you can exploit this guy. I think it's definitely not going to be plus EV to call, especially from the small blind. I think in the big blind it would be a bit closer, and even then I'd probably consider just folding. It's not really a hand that I'm like super thrilled about turning into a bluff, because of course if we're 3-betting polarised we can have a lot of better more playable, less dominated hands. It's the kind of hand that if we three bet, we're gonna run into like ace jack, king jack, king queen, ace queen all day long and be like in pretty bad shape. So yeah, I agree, yeah. it's definitely just gonna be a fold. And the, the other thing about being in the small blind is you've always got to factor in your likelihood of being squeezed. You have a 26, 16 in your big blind on table three, so it's not like a huge possibility that you're gonna get squeezed. It seems more likely that that guy won't be a light squeezer, but nevertheless, that still does add some more situations that you just don't get to see a flop in, which is pretty bad, obviously. So yeah, definitely something that's, um, if you're looking to improve blind play there, I think your thought process is a little on the loose side, even though you did decide on a fold. Um, you want to be a more slam dunk just folding that spot for sure, because it's not going to be good. Um, so yeah, we'll just continue trying to tighten up in those spots a little bit. So table four, what's going on here? Just talk me through. Um, I should have made it. Uh, to an half X, but I min opened with ace queen. Okay, it was a mistake. Um, I just see bet and he called. He was obviously a fish. Mm -hmm. And here I'm just going to bet, bet, bet. I think um, just figuring out a size that can. Yeah, just get it all in by the river. Looks good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 150 looks fine as well. You just want to find something that's not going to like terrify any of its range at all and is going to get it all in by the river and it's very easy to do that there with those um, stack sizes. One thing you can even do there is you can consider checking the flop just because you can probably get it in on two streaks anyway just by betting big and it gives them a chance to like spaz out with any air that he folds on a dry board to your c-bet. So that's an option as is c-betting really small again to try yeah, and to induce. Um, induce. Yep. Yeah, the more um, I should say the less need you have to build a pot, the more it becomes relevant or becomes a consideration for you to start slow playing the earlier streets or to be putting less money in to try and induce more action. Obviously, if you if you need to bet three times fairly big to get it all in, you don't want to be doing that and potentially costing yourself value. But yeah, the more the less streets you need to get the money in, the more you can consider slow playing and also the drier the board, the more you can consider slow playing in those situations. So. I don't think it's totally unreasonable just to bet even smaller on the flop there. So we see bet the ace four. I think some people will check this spot and it's probably bad. You would check? No, no, I, say, I was saying that some people would check on the flop and I think that's pretty bad because we just don't have enough equity to bluff catch or try and get the showdown. Yeah, I was but, just going to say we don't, our hands not strong enough to get the showdown exactly. on the streets, so I thought... We're effectively bang. Yeah, so we're basically treating our hand as a semi-bluff that can sometimes get called by worse hands in the form of draws um, and can improve on later streets and have equity against better pairs and things like that. So yeah, but easy see bit just with our immediate fold equity and stuff. And now on the turn, um, we get flatted. What are you thinking on the turn? Uh, I'm thinking that card can potentially uh, improve its range or give its end range more equity. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm just going to check back and give up I think yeah I think, I think it I mean, seems reasonable and then he bets 125 into 247 so you need 3 to, you're getting like 3 to 1 here he is he is some kind of regular though do you think yeah, he'd take the size as a bluff very often no never I mean I think he's got like 7-6 often sort of yeah, Five, I think six. Queen X here is like fairly likely as well. I think like raising is somewhat tempting, but the problem is that you just raise like absolutely you rep absolutely nothing. You're just repping like some random straight they got there on the river. And it's yeah. not a whole lot of hands that you're repping there. So I think it's fairly transparent and easy for him to just call off with Queen X there if you do raise. So yeah, I like the way you play the hand. I, I, I like giving up on that turn and just taking your pair to showdown and like maybe on really good rivers or something. You could consider like bluff catching, but I mean it's not it's not gonna be great. Um barreling there on that kind of texture when the thing is with queen high boards, generally cold calling ranges have quite a lot of queens in them just because 
um, hands like ace king and things get three bet all the time, whereas hands like king queen queen jack suited king jack uh, queen jack suited ace queen are typically more common hands that people like to flat in those kind of situations. So I think queen high boards are, if I had to make like a blanket statement, which is obviously never great in poker, queen high boards are less good to just like barrel off on than like king high boards usually, or to fire two on there, because you just get, you run into top pair a bit more often, I think. Yeah, I think here I wouldn't usually uh, flat coco sixes, but... Yeah, I, I think, think you've got quite an easy flat in this instance, just because you're a bit yeah. deeper and you have position, yeah. And there's a fish in the big blind. Yeah, you've got like all the ingredients you want to flat there, basically. It's like a slam dunk set mining spot. Um, I think you need to be careful if you're only 100 deep, your opponent's a bit looser, so your implied odds are less and you don't have a fish behind you and you even have squeezers behind you. In that kind of spot, I'd be very happy just folding sixes. But when you've got all those, you've got like the opposite of all of those factors, then it's going to be a good spot to set mine for sure. Here are isolated fish, but he cold calls, uh, he calls, um, he overcalls from the big oh, line. Okay, right. And the fish, and the fish folds. I it's a, I think it's a pretty standard sea bet. Yeah, I'm okay sea bet in there with like two good overcards. I think if you had like a worse <laughs> hand, I would be somewhat tempted just to give up. If you had like pocket fives or something, I wouldn't even mind yeah. just giving up there. But with Ace King, I think it's okay. Um, the 10 turn is a weird one because it gives them a lot more equity. A lot of hands like yeah. Jack 10 and stuff do pick up equity, but you do have an option to fire three. Like It's certainly not totally unreasonable to fire three streaks on the 10, but it's, it is one of the worst cards. So I think like a give up there when you have not so much equity is fine. Certainly betting the turn and then giving up River is like the worst option if you are yeah, I just bet. I think like a lot of his range is like, King, Queen and Pairs, which picked up, you know, like Eights and Jacks and stuff, which aren't folding. Yeah, they're so, not folding on the turn, but perhaps you can get some of those hands to fold on the river yeah, um, if yeah. you fire three. But it's this close. I mean, it's one of those situations where you just shouldn't fire again. Whenever the turn improves your opponent's equity in the form of giving him draws to go with pairs and pairs to go with draws, you know what I mean? Then your yeah. immediate fold equity on that street goes way down. But perhaps when all those draws then brick and he's left with some mediocre pair, the third barrel can work. So it's just the kind of spot to be aware of where it's like a fire three or give up straight away kind of spot. Here I decide to take the fish and make a smallish sea bet on a really dry flop. Mm -hmm. think that's pretty standard. Um, yeah, I don't like doing anything on the turn here. I like just giving up on, yeah. this, on this card for sure. If he checks, it would be interesting. But I just don't think that aids a high enough card to get him to fold out much. Nah. I think as well, whenever a street checks through, I say this all the time, but whenever a street checks through, a fish's calling range almost always expands on the following street, just because they're like, in their head, there's inconsistency. You checked and then you bet, therefore it's more likely you're bluffing type thing. Yeah. So in fish logic, it's generally bad to take a bet check bet line as a bluff, usually. Not always, of course. If he has loads of missed draws in his range and you have 8 high and you just want to fold a 10 high missed draw, then it's fine to bet small. But generally, getting a fish to fold pairs and things like that with bet check bet is going to be bad in general. So we flat the ace jack out of the blinds. Yeah, I could have toyed with 3 bet because he has a really low 3 bet, but it's only over seven samples so it's not really a sample i want to go off and making a three bet is that is, a sorry is that fold, fold to three bet that 14. yeah fold to three bet yeah yeah okay yeah i can see what you mean then in that kind of situation it definitely does make it more likely that you want to go ahead and just three bet that hand for value as long as he's not four betting all the time that would kind of suck but i mean flattening a stack is the standard play there i don't mind either so turn checks through yeah and i was just gonna uh see if he wanted to bluff at it but yeah, I don't think you're going to induce very much in the way of bluffs there. I think you're, because most of your range is like pocket pairs that are just like bluff, great bluff catchers and he doesn't have an ace very often at all. So I don't think that he's, re I don't think bluff catching is the best way to go. I think making a really small value bet that just gets called by like King X or a pair is by far the best way. Because by checking, you allow him to check back some hands he can call a value bet with, such as King High or a pair in between the aces and the fours or whatever it was. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, so definitely a small river bet there is the best line. Uh, 
Um, this Jack Queen is obviously. I think he's got a lot of draws in his range. Um, oh shit! I'm just going to flat there. Yeah, we'll be on the button there, and we see better. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and he check raised. Yeah, I think he's given you such a good price there that you can probably peel one for sure. Yeah, um, I was going to peel one, but I timed out. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. I mean, you don't need yeah. him to shut down on the turn very often for that peel to be fine. And I think at twenty five and L, people generally would err on the side of not like bluffing too many turns there if they have poor equity. I think this guy does play a lot of tables. Yeah, uh, yeah. Just, I mean, he's playing. The other thing is as well that club turns are really good for you. Well, they're not really good for you, but they do give you equity to like continue and stuff like that. And you block a lot of the flush draws you can have by having the queen of clubs. So club turn is not really all that bad in this kind of situation. Yeah. Um, also, a 10 turn obviously gives you a load of equity as well. And a queen and a jack turn is pretty nice. So there are some good turn cards there and you're getting a good enough price. That I think if you don't time out, I think peeling is definitely the right option. Um, yeah. But you want to be careful there. I wouldn't be... I wouldn't be wanting if the turn comes to five of diamonds and he blasts it, I'd be pretty content just folding as there are quite a few value hands he can have there. Yeah, it's interesting that he check raised so small. Yeah. Jack ten on table two. Pretty easy flat, just, right? Yeah, just be a flat. Especially because we're well, yeah, we're deep. That's probably makes it a flat. Yeah. Stood up for one second there, and the cat jumped on my seat, and I removed him. He hissed at me. I don't know if you <laughs> heard that. Uh, no, I didn't. <laughs> Damn. He's always hissing and growling at me in the middle of videos, but he never seems to pick it up properly on camera. It's great though. <laughs> Tables keep breaking. We're like yeah. four or five handed all the time. So what would you how would you explain? Um obviously I don't play twenty five and L, but how would you explain it or describe it to someone who is like moving up to twenty five and limit for the first time? Um, I'd say it's 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 fine. Um the regs aren't that good. I mean I've to be honest, I've been trying to play with on reg field tables at the moment just because I'm trying to improve and get better. And it's way harder for me to play. Well, not way harder, but it's harder for me to play against a regular than it is, obviously, a fish. It's just it's buzzing out. Yeah. Uh, so for me, in terms of improving it in the long term, it's better for me to play against regs. Uh, once he checks back, I think... He either has like a weakish flush draw or sort of a. I think he bets a king. I don't know why he checked back here. Yeah, um, so you're just going to try and go for some value against like second pair of type hands and that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, I guess he could have queen jack, ace jack type hands. Yeah, seems solid. Uh, here I want to four bet this guy. You can see three bets like a monkey out of the big mind. I'm, I'm, I'm cool four betting this hand section, right? Sorry, what? Oh, right, okay, on table three. Uh, I haven't got any time back left again. I don't know what's going on. But. So you're in position there, like cut off versus big blind, was it? No. Yeah, big blind. He threw bets. Like, he re steals like 13% out of. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it's close between. Yeah, I mean, hijack against small blind there, I think flatting is maybe like a little bit too loose. Um, I think if you aren't going to flat it, you should definitely make it one of your four bet hands just because its blockers are so good. Um, and it's like really at the top yeah. of your folding range from a four bet bluffing point of view. So, yeah, I think that it's definitely a reasonable hand if you're going to have a four bet bluff range there, which you probably should against that kind of guy. Then, yeah, I think a four bet's a pretty solid approach. You make it close to min and put him in like quite a bad spot just to manipulate the side to pot ratio. With your four bet sizing, so that he can't like shit profitably on you light or anything like that. And like you say, um, there's a lot of three betting at twenty five and L, but there's not very much, not too much light four and five betting. Yeah, so you yeah, can probably get a lot yeah, of. Yeah, sorry, I was going to talk about that one. 
So four betting is probably something that's fairly profitable still, even in 2013 at these stakes, just to four bet bluff quite a lot. And that's why you were saying before you've got more of a, you've got your range weighted more towards bluffs, both with three betting and four betting, which I think is the right approach at 25 yeah. now, where people aren't taking their aggression pre-flop to the next level yet and sort of four betting a lot and five betting a lot to adjust to that. And yeah, that's definitely good. one thing I'd say. You can fall back quite comfortably with uh, with uh, hands that's got blockers to big hand, well, to aces and kings and queens, really, in ace yeah. king. That's the sort of, that's any sort of hand people are five back shipping, so you can yeah. stick a bunch of ace x suited, king x suited in your fallback range to with block, so you've got blockers. Yep. One thing I've been messing around with as well is uh, is three betting to slightly smaller in position. Mm -hmm. So I know that's probably not a it's not it's definitely not a common thing I'd say at twenty five on full tilt. Um, but reg seems to flat more and yeah, and presumably and not play so well. If, you, if you're uh, full betting smaller as well, people seem to. I have had a couple of regs five bet forward on me, mm -hmm. so I was originally four betting to like two point five, two point six x. Yeah, is but that in position or out? Um, in position. Uh -huh. So, but if you like sort of just over two x it, yeah, um, you seem to be getting a lot more spazzes on people like yeah, you will do. I mean, really small or flatting and just folding to three, folding to c bets and stuff. Um. Yeah, so you will get a lot of guys that just fold anyway to small four bets as well. I mean, I think they're going two point six x these days in position with a four bet, hundred big blinds deep is like totally unnecessary. It's just something that burns extra money. Like when you four bet, it's the case that you just are going to run into a value range and get shipped on some percent of the time. And um, so unless there's like huge benefits to going bigger um, that outweigh the fact that you lose more money the times you run into that part of the range, then there's not really any reason to go bigger. So yeah, I think that men four betting and just over men and stuff like that in position is best. And I find even at 100 NL, you still get a lot of people who will just play straightforwardly and fold to men four bets and things like that. They don't like playing four bet pots out of position. And if they do start flattening you wide, that's not really a big deal. You can just change your four bet range, keep your same sizing, and incorporate more hands like King Queen suited that just flop like a dream against their flat range and stuff like that. So there are definitely ways to combat those guys when you find out who they are. Down to three tables. <laughs> yeah, you can fire up another one if you want. Yeah, I've got... I just sat down here. So I was going to play that guy heads, heads up, but I um, got to find another table, but sat out and then went to sit back in and he left. So. so what's your table selection process like in these games? Um, as I said, I have been trying to play a few more regs in the daytime, so I've been playing more day sessions where I sort of like a focus session that I'm trying to really improve against regulars. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll play like six tables of just, not the toughest tables I can buy in, but not really tables like that hard. But okay. in other games, when I'm playing normal, normal sessions, I try and get at least to direct direct left or direct right one fish. Yeah. Um, so obviously I can play more pots um, in position if he's on my right and then yeah. I can play a lot more pots in the blinds if uh, if they're on my left. Mm -hmm. well, I, I think would that's say kind of that. something that people don't really take into consideration is the fact that you can play pots with fish when you're on the button and they're in the blinds because they do flat a lot. Yeah, um, this is the thing. I mean, having fish to your left is actually, I think, very underrated. People tend to say, oh, if you don't have a fish to your right, it's like a bad table. But if you have a guy who you know, sort of flats his blinds absurdly wide and then just plays fit or fold on the flop. Like, where do you really want that guy to be? You want him to be to your left in that situation because your buttons and cutoffs are just so profitable. So, yeah, absolutely, I agree. I think that's definitely an underrated part of table selection is having those kind of guys to your left. The kind of fish you obviously don't want to your left is the kind of really aggro one that's just making life very difficult all the time because he has position on you. And he might be bad, but it's so high variance and... It's very difficult, especially if you're card dead, that you do want position on that kind of one, for sure. So we're going to go for a check call now. It seems kind of reasonable on table one. Yeah, I think he had, I was banged twice because I think he has a lot of, like, gutters and jack tens. And yeah, for sure. 
I mean, you will run into some Queen X here for sure, but like Queen X will raise the turn some amount, and you split with all the. Um, no, you don't split with all the other kings. But I, I don't yeah, know. I just think he has There's enough mistrust. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Not so often, but he has that sort of stuff. I mean, he might even have stuff like Ace Jack or something stupid like that that he's flirted twice. Yeah, for sure, or like something like Ace Ten that turned a flush draw or anything like that. Yeah. I mean, when when you only need to be good like um, twenty seven percent of the time or whatever it is in that spot, maybe twenty eight percent. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, and there's that many missed draws in your opponent's range, you can probably find a, a check call pretty easily there. Another important thing to realize is that there's no value to be had by betting, so you need to choose between check calling and check folding in that spot because betting just doesn't make any sense. You only get called or raised by better hands and everything else folds. So you definitely have to check that spot. That's the first thing to decide or to realize, and then you need to decide whether you should be check calling or check folding. And I agree, I think that you can definitely check call to that kind of sizing pretty happily. I think uh, one of the mistakes I would have made previously would be to check the turn, but I think there's just so many more. Yeah. So much more value to be had. Uh, yeah, I mean, the thing is that even if you can check the turn, with the reasoning that you know you're going to be able to bluff cast the river, okay, you make an extra bet from his draws in that situation, but you also get that bet by value betting the turn as well, and then you can still bluff cast blank rivers as well. So, yeah, I think betting the turn there is probably the easiest way to play the to play the hand. And if you do get raised, I think you can fold pretty easily, just because there's so many queen x in his range when he raises turn. Um, downside to that is if your opponent's capable of turning bad pairs into bluffs there and raising draws in the turn to rep Queen X, that can be a bit problematic. Maybe against that kind of guy, you do want to balance a little bit and have some stronger hands when you check back the turn. The other thing to realise yeah. is that it's a turn you give up a lot of the time. So if you are against someone competent and you're betting all your kings there, then your checking range becomes absurdly weak and exploitable and they can play very well against that. However, it's not such a big deal at these stakes when people aren't really thinking along these lines. It's probably fine just to have a fairly weak checking range there and be betting all your top pair and better. Yeah. Uh, here, I fall back A2 suited because this guy re-steals 20% from the big blind. And I think I should have checked the flop, but I think C bang is bad because we don't really we don't really have much equity and we don't have any... He's not going to fold anything really that he's going to be flying to a fallback. back. Yeah, it's not a bad flop for his 4-bet flatting range there. Maybe so you I can get him to fold ace queen sometimes, but I mean, there's so many hands there um, that just have a lot of equity. You can flop sets or you can have over pairs or you can have like straight draws and over cards and things. So, yeah. Yeah, I think just giving up there is fine. Um, if you think about what his range, what do you think his range looks like, this 26 to 19 guy? I think it could be a bit looser, would you agree, than most people's? Like maybe more weighted towards broadways and less weighted towards like big pairs or anything like that. Probably more straightforward and a bit more face up when he's got that gap between the VPAP and the PFR. I think we'd see a lot of suited broadways and things like that there for sure. It's not really a situation I'm really that common with, to, uh, mm -hmm. familiar with. To be honest, flying four bets in position, especially uh, twenty five, this rarely not, like rarely goes on. Yeah. So I was a bit, I'm a bit un unsure about what his range would look like. To be honest. Yeah. Um, in that spot. But if he he doesn't have a uh, I sent you two two samples, but so I am not sure. He actually seems really like a fish history. now from what we can see going on here. It's kind of interesting, just like ships a flop with like some measly top pair of hand for no reason. This king's hand I squeeze um it's quite flat, so I don't know anything about him. He's playing three tables, so he could be a fish, he could be a regular, just moving up, or just trying to focus. Yeah, did you check the flop? Yeah. Was that fair? Do you think? I think that, fair? um... In terms of balance, I don't think it's fine, but... Yeah, the, the thing about it is it makes your hand, like, pretty straightforward if you check call there. And I'm not super thrilled. I would usually just bet, like, half pot in the flop, or bet, like, pretty small and expect I mean, it, to get called by some worse stuff and get to show them more easily that way rather than sort of turning my hand face up. I mean, are you planning to check call when you check? Yeah, I just think, uh, I was going to say, it turns, kind of turns my hand face up to anyone that can hand read 
semi well. <laughs> yeah, it's just the only thing that concerns me is he's like twenty six, twenty four so far. He seems like more of like an active, um, regular. I would take that line against someone who had a very wide flattening range pre flop, and then was likely just to bet blindly every time he was checked to. I'm okay with it against him, but against someone that's a bit more laggy, I like just keeping. I'm going to be c betting that board. Um, quite a lot, and it is quite a good board for my range, so I'd rather just keep things simple there and see bet. I think with kings, especially when I can sort of do it semi for value as well. I yeah, think we probably. I, think that was a mistake. I, I don't think it's a big mistake, but I just I do think it's a more coherent way to play your range. There is just to bet everything that you can get value with, um, and then that allows you to see bet more as well with your range and just yeah get more money in on the flop with a wider range. And a lot of his range is going to be things like under pairs as well that aren't necessarily even going to turn themselves into a bluff. You know what yes. I mean? Because if he has like a pair of jacks there or something, um, or whatever wouldn't have been a set, then it's quite likely that his betting range contains a lot more ace-x because those pairs are just going to check back and get the showdown, but they might even call one. That's another reason I like betting, just because, yeah, he might not have too much air in that spot, but he might have a lot of random hands that can call one street. And then giving free cards is like never like great if you don't have to as well. So it's kind of close spot. It's a spot that gives people a lot of trouble. I know there's some disagreement about it, but I've come to the conclusion that betting that spot is more often than not the best thing to do, unless you've got a very specific read about what you're going to do if you check and why. This guy never falls to see why. Well, Feel bets really low, so I I don't mind checking back here. Yeah, I'm not this, bothered kind of about whether you see bet there or not. To be honest, I mean it's. On turns like this as well, you can definitely call as well when you have the nut ace high and a gut shot and yeah, you're going to hit the rivers that he's going to bluff and things like that and you may just give up in the river. Are we batting here or just checking back? Um, yeah, it's kind of interesting. Like, I kind of want to... I feel like if he has a queen, the thing yeah, is that we shouldn't really have a flush draw here, ever, right? Sorry? I feel like we should bet, right? And I'll explain why I think we should bet. Yeah, he never has a queen. He could have well, a he can sometimes, but he shouldn't do, because he should bet the river if he has a queen. Like, it doesn't make sense for him to check a queen here. I feel like if he has a queen, it's really silly for him to check, because we just don't have that many missed draws or hands that are going to bluff. By far, our big, the biggest thing that we have is a hand like with medium showdown value with like some pair or like a pair of jacks that got there in a turn or maybe like pocket tens or something like that. That's what our range looks like. It's not a range that really needs to bluff. It's a range that's trying to get to showdown. Um, there might be a few turn straight draws in there, but the thing is that we bet all our flush draws on the flop, right? So they're gone from our range and he should know that because he's like a, a regular, right? Yeah. So if he has a queen, he's surely betting. If he even has like ace jack, he might be betting for thin value. So we should probably just bet and make like, we don't need to make it too big, we can just rep like ace-jack, king-jack there ourselves pretty easily and just get him to fold like pocket fours. The problem with checking back is that he can be turning like small pairs that he's just never calling rivers with into bluffs. And if he's turning small pairs into bluffs, sorry, if he's, yeah, if he's turning those pairs into a bluff on the turn and giving up on the river, then it's kind of disastrous for us to check back ace high and lose. Um, when we can just get him to fold most of his range because we've discounted Queen X and stuff like that. So yeah, that's why I think it's a bet for sure. And here we get raised by 23-21, fairly aggro. I would just try and get all the money in right now. Like this is a great spot just to 3-bet and get it in, I think. He may well not even have 2s and 5s in his range. He may not have jacks. This is the kind of board where sets are very rare because people have learned that flatting small pocket pairs isn't good anymore. So he might not have sets, he's repping very little, maybe as an like ace-jack or something, but we have shitloads of equity against a hand like ace-jack ace here or something like that. And one hand he might well get in here is like he might spew with ace-three just with a gut shot, or he might spew with like a worse spade draw or something like yeah, that. Yeah, spade draw. I think that's a, probably a spade draw. Would be nice if he ships here. Yeah, because we've just got. See, I can't see him raising. I, I mean, I don't see him raising many jacks here no. unless it's a set, but nobody makes sets. And also, so, when it's 2 5 jack, that's the kind of texture that there aren't many of the set making pairs on that board that he's flattening out the blinds, right? Because he's not flattening jacks there, he's presumably 3 betting it. And 2s and 5s 
people are often just folding those pre-flop these days. So 2-5 jack is a very good board for us to fuck with him on because he just doesn't have sets hardly ever, right? Yeah, yeah. You're with me? So that's like a great board for us to 3-bet bluff as well. I would be 3-bet bluff in there if I had just like a random hand or I'd be floating, I'd be playing back in some way quite a lot there because he really is just repping like, especially when I have the ace of spades, right? I don't think I'm going to get shipped on because he doesn't have any nut flush draws to ship on me, he doesn't have any sets to ship on me. Basically, whenever I have the ace of spades in my hand in that spot, I'm just not folding. I'm going to do something, you know what I mean? Because yeah, it's yeah. just so few hands he can continue with. So I could have like the ace of spades and like a random nine of hearts there, and I'm still probably going to three-bet bluff it or something. Just like three-bet bluff all the time and have the ace of spades and just own him. It seems to be a good way to go, because it's just a board that you cannot really rep very much on. Of course, the way he can adjust to that is to start raising top pairs there. Um, and he does have some strong hands like Queen Jack of Spades and stuff like that, but more often than not, if he's an aggro reg, he's just going to be way out of line there with his bluffing frequencies. When we hold the Ace of Spades, he's just going to have like little to no equity, far too much, and we can exploit that very easily. What do you think about the flatting now with the Ace of Spades? I don't like I mean, it so much because we miss out on the opportunity to get loads of money in against more spade draws right now. Okay. Um, and also, I think when the turn comes randomly, like we don't have any showdown value yet, and if we don't pick up any by the river, after we've called flop, and obviously we're calling turn as well with that much equity on any turn card, right? But if it does brick by the time we get to the river and he follows through with some bluffs, it's just a really weird, difficult, dodgy spot for us to do anything about. So when we've got like a safe way to just play the hand really plus EV, I would 3-bet all the time there. And then what I would do is I would throw in some three bet bluffs and I would three bet my sets and things like that um, in order to balance basically and stop him seeing cheap cards with flush draws if he was planning on giving up turns and things like that. So I would basically yeah. just three bet everything there that I was continuing with most of the time. A apart from obviously like if I have a hand like pocket aces, I'm not going to three bet that, I'm just going to call. But when it comes to like really strong value hands and really good draws and then bluffs, I'm going to be semi polarized and three betting a lot. Here I just folded flies brief up when he three bets me and this guy cold calls. Yeah, I don't, seems I, I'm just I'm already. If it was a bigger pair, then yeah, I mean if you're getting a better there, price to set mine, and if you're closing the action, it's not so bad. Um, going yeah, back to the way, but I, I think flies is just too small a pair for me personally. Well, it depends. I mean, if you're set mining, you're set mining, right? Like, if you can profitably set mine, then you shouldn't really care what your pair is, whether it's nines or fives. Nines is a bit better because you can yeah. get to more showdowns more easily. But generally, you're set mining because you're set mining. So okay. you should be looking more at implied odds, stack size, position, closing the action, likelihood of, you know, implied odds, basically how much money you expect to make on average when you do proper set, stack sizes, that kind of thing. Um, I wouldn't be too... I wouldn't say there's very much difference between having sevens there and having fives there at all. Going back to that last hand, actually, you were talking about when you might flat. I think one hand you would want to flat there is something like six, seven of spades when he check raises you, just because you really don't want to get shipped on when you have like a bad flush draw that you don't want to felt, but you definitely don't want to fold. So you just want to like float in position and look to take it away and improve or make a flush, basically. So my flatting range would be like weaker draws that I wasn't happy getting in but didn't want to be blown off of and it would be like showdown value hands that weren't like really strong like sort of top pair type stuff maybe some over pairs or some like pocket tens or whatever and then my three bet range would be lots of stuff that contained the ace of spades nut flush draws sets and that kind of thing and then I might fold stuff that had like no ace of spades and no equity basically so that's how I would sort of chunk up my range in that spot against that guy So we turn two pair and just keep firing on table one, yeah? Yeah, I bet. I mean, almost. But I think we can spit here again. Like five. Yeah, I think five's okay. I definitely wouldn't go any bigger. And then just bet folding, obviously, yeah. Yeah. Um, 
I might just go like 490 just for the yeah. bigger factor. Yeah, like it. It's like the retailer strategy of knocking off like 10 cents, so it looks like it costs much less. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, a sick play here is for him to turn like a seven into a bluff and raise, but I mean, you're at 25 NL, so I wouldn't be too worried about that. I would just fold here. Yeah, it's insane. But it's a very nice spot. Like, your sizing there is the kind of thing that as you move up, people are going to be able to ship on you there with like lots of stuff that they can now turn into a bluff because you don't have a flush all that often. But actually, if you think about it, it makes sense for you to bet that size with a bluff is. Sorry, with a flush as well, because what are you hoping to get called by? A6? Yeah, Maybe some weak exactly. through there? Maybe some worse flushes, but if you've got like a, a bad flush, you're probably not going to be like blasting there either. So, I mean, you are kind of protected in that sense. You can still have flushes when you bet that size, so I'm not worried about it. And especially at these stakes, I'm not worried about it anyway. But it's useful just to think about what our range looks like and how that's going to affect us if we're playing against someone more competent. <laughs> So that's maybe just because I'm like really big on um, strategy right now, I guess. This guy seems to be three running quite a bit far. There's nothing really I can do there. Yeah. So yeah, man, your game is looking looking pretty solid for the most part. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna probably plan cool check, probably check all once, depending on the turn, obviously. Yeah. Um, yeah, he isn't actually open yet from the call, which is kind of weird. So that guy was sitting out. Yeah, you're a big blind here. He's cut off, right? Yeah. <laughs> He sort of bombs the turn. Yeah, I would fold here. I don't think that you can profitably call this turn, unfortunately. I think yeah, if you call uh, this turn, then you're calling the river on blanks, and then I think it's just kind of bad. Yeah, I think what I used to do really is call here and then end up with some six spots in the river. So I think yeah. just folding here with the mine. Yeah, I mean, I don't think you get too many guys at these stakes who are actually going to just bomb turn with like no equity there. I think you are going to see like a flush draw or a value hand most of the time. So. Kind of, and yeah, and you don't know what his river frequencies are, so it's a kind of spot where having no initiative in a medium strength hand just like screws you for playing the next street. So you should just be really cut some losses and fold in turn. Yeah, I'd say your game overall is not many holes in it. It seems like pretty, pretty good um, for beating twenty five NL these days for sure um maybe just don't try and go overboard or play too many hands out of position just like keep that somewhat under check um but yeah i was thinking in this video i would have a bunch of leaks already but there's not really been any spots that have illustrated any big leaks for sure so for now we'll just keep doing what we're doing and expect to get in some volume and do well one thing i would say about table selection is that don't be too um don't be too hasty to try and play against regs just because you can play against regs all the time and you will anyway even if you table select amazingly you're still going to have plenty of regs on your tables overall um so i think that you don't need to go looking for any you can just find as many fish as you can and your reg game will still improve while you're doing that because you're always yeah. going to have a few regs just try and get up the stakes and get in volume and have as good a win rate as you can i think improving your game against regs will happen anyway at a good pace um, so definitely table select maximally, for sure. I threw back those things just because I think that this fish is just going to call so much and fold through bet, fold to see bets. Yeah, so he's like a forty-five twenty-two fish. Yeah, there's just a mid like this seems like a bit more immediate value rather than me just flatting and then. Yeah, yeah, I like that play actually. It's definitely not bad at all. If you're against someone who you think just gives up a lot post flop, then you can definitely take a hand like sixes. And three bet, and then you still have mega implied odds sometimes when you flop a set, and yeah, you have way more ways to win the hand. Usually sixes isn't like my favorite hand to do it with. I think it's fine, but even better is if you have like king jack there. It's like a slam dunk three bet, and then c bet, basically. 
Okay, I'm going to wrap up this video for now, Jake, right? Um, yeah, that's fine. It's been awesome, though. Thanks very much for sharing your game with Grinder School. And we'll come back in a couple of weeks, time Grinder School style for you guys. I mean, Jake, I'll see you like tomorrow when we make the next episode. <laughs> but <Yep>. you guys <laughs> will see the next video soon. Um, this is the end of December. It's probably going to be out sort of toward going into the new year. This series will be will be happening. Um, and next time, what we'll do is we'll do some hand history reviews for the tough spots sort of that have come up recently and we'll sort of filter in for some more difficult situations because I do think that your basic game is pretty damn solid pre-flop and on the flop in a common situation so we'll try and find some turn and river spots next time where they're a bit yeah. more difficult and like go through those and analyse them that should yeah, be that, interesting that would definitely be helpful yeah okay cool alright guys you can leave any questions that you have for the two of us on the thread and I'll get back to you about it and I'll see you guys very soon on the next video. Thanks very much for watching.